Welcome back to another episode of Space This Week. We once again have a jam-packed episode. Not only did we see the very first full view of the Starship Raptor 3 engine hit the internet, the fifth and sixth modules of the second Starbase Tower were stacked and Ship 30 returned to the Mega Bay for possible transportation for another static fire test at Massey's. Falcon 9 was no slouch either, carrying the 21st Northrop Grumman Cygnus resupply spacecraft to the International Space Station, as well as a total of 46 more Starlink satellites, including the first 23 Starlink Group 11 satellites, to low Earth orbit across two launches. We also saw the last Atlas V launch to carry a national security payload, China launched a high orbit communication satellite to geosynchronous orbit, Rocket Lab conducted their fifth of 16 dedicated launches for the Strix constellation, NASA's NeoWise mission will be ending in just a few days, we saw fantastic new views of Jupiter on Juno's most recent flyby, and much, much more. Enjoy. I'm sure you've all heard the big news now, and that is the grand reveal of SpaceX's Raptor 3 engine. And I have to agree with many people that upon first look, this thing looks so clean it could almost be a 3D render. I mean, we can compare it to two other modern engines, Ariane 6's Vulcan 2.1 and Vulcan's BE4, and it's so minimalist by comparison. Even when comparing it to Raptor 1 and 2, this thing just looks so simple. The reason behind its very bare bones appearance is down to a few things. Firstly, Raptor 3 doesn't require a heat shield or a fire suppression system, and this is partly thanks to many of the external plumbing being moved internally. A lot of the pipes here will have smaller pipes running through them, and this all improves the engine's regenerative cooling, to very, very oversimplify things. Some people have called this photo a little dishonest, as this isn't the complete engine, and that it will need more components adding to it to actually function, but I don't know, it, it looks pretty much as is in this photo of it in the test stand, ready to begin hot fire tests. Back at Starbase, the big thing we're all following right now is the construction of Orbital Launch Pad B. We've been seeing the stack and catch tower rise up at about one to two modules per week, and last week was no exception to this cadence. We saw the raising and mounting of the tower's fifth segment, and we knew it wouldn't be too long before the sixth module would rise, as this was rolled to the site not long after module five was installed, and it was subsequently hooked up to the load spreader. Saturday was the day of the big lift, and in no time at all, the tower stood six segments in height. SpaceX are getting ready for module number seven installation, and the load spreader has now been removed from the top of the tower, and the crane is currently undergoing reconfiguration to allow it to continue stacking the tower for this launch pad. Well, I suppose it's a bit of a stretch to call this area a launch pad, since right now it is just a partially constructed tower. When are we going to see the installation of a launch pad one style launch pad? Well, Never. SpaceX recently published plans for how they plan to expand the launch site area, which includes the expected addition of more water and propellant tanks to support two launch sites, and it also shows the existing orbital launch mount, which looks markedly different to the proposed new launch mount. This looks a lot like what we all expected. SpaceX are building a flame trench. The space engineer posted a mock-up on Twitter X. of how this may end up looking, and I'm certainly excited to see how it comes together. This isn't the first Starship flame trench SpaceX have built though, they of course recently completed the flame trench at Massey's for ship static fires, with Ship 30 performing one in late July. It was then rolled back to the production area and stored in the rocket garden. Until very recently. On Saturday, it was transported from here to Mega Bay 2, where it was then attached to the two-point lifting rig and, well, lifted. We then later saw the arrival of the mobile static fire pad at Mega Bay 2 earlier today, meaning that SpaceX might be planning to perform another static fire test of this vehicle. It's kind of anyone's guess at this stage at the moment. Let me know what you think in the comments below, though it has recently had one of its vacuum Raptor engines swapped out, so a repeat static fire would make sense. Falcon 9 had a busy week of launches. There were three in total, a Cygnus resupply mission to the International Space Station and two Starlink launches. The two Starlinks are on the 2nd and 4th of August respectively, and each rocket carries 23 satellites in total. The second of the two launches carried the first Starlink Group 11 satellites. Not that you could really see the launch too well, thanks to the fog that often occludes launches from Vandenberg. Both missions were a success though, with both Falcon 9 first stage boosters making successful landings on their drone ships. The Falcon 9 Cygnus mission took place yesterday, launching from Space Launch Complex 40 at Cape Canaveral Space Force Station. This is the second of three Cygnus spacecraft built by Northrop Grumman to be launched to the International Space Station via a Falcon 9, and the craft is currently en route to the station. 
Meanwhile, Falcon 9's first stage had enough remaining fuel at stage separation to make the journey all the way back to land, touching down at landing zone 1. The Cygnus is carrying just over 3.5 metric tons of supplies to the station and is scheduled to be captured by the station's robotic arm tomorrow. Rocket Lab had a successful Electron launch last week. On Friday, they launched their Owl for One, One for Owl mission from Mahia, New Zealand. On board the Electron was the Strix 4 satellite, and this was Rocket Lab's fifth of 16 dedicated launches for private Japanese firm Synspective's Strix Constellation. The Strix Constellation was developed through Japan's Impact Program and is a pioneering effort in synthetic aperture radar technology, providing high resolution Earth imagery at a fraction of the cost of conventional satellites, and Synspective ultimately want the constellation to consist of 30 satellites by the late 2020s. We had a rather historic Atlas V mission last Tuesday. This was the USSF-51 mission and the last national security launch mission for Atlas V, now that United Launch Alliance has moved on to their Vulcan rocket for future launches. Though this mission was originally meant to fly on Vulcan Centaur, but the switch to Atlas was made at United Launch Alliance's request. This also happened to be their 100th ever national security payload, so a fitting celebration as we say goodbye to the legendary Atlas V launch vehicle. Now given the secretive payload, not a great deal is known about the three onboard satellites other than that they've been sent to a geosynchronous orbit. Now this isn't the final ever Atlas launch, like ever, but it's still expected to make nine more flights between now and 2030. The majority of these launches will be for Amazon's Project Kuiper satellite constellation, their answer to SpaceX's Starlink, and Boeing's Starliner missions 1 through 6. Though, of course, there may be delays with these missions, given that Starliner's current flight is now eight weeks into its planned eight day duration due to unexpected problems with the spacecraft. The final orbital launch we saw last week came from China on Thursday. This is a Long March 3B, carrying the WHG High Orbit Internet Services satellite to geosynchronous Earth orbit. Now, not a great deal more information was shared about this satellite, but I suppose it being just for internet services, there isn't really much else to discuss. It's been about 15 years since the launch of NASA's NEOWISE mission, but it now looks like things are coming to an end. Launching in December 2009, the then called WISE, standing for Wide Field Infrared Survey Explorer, embarked on its six month mission to study the astrophysical sky, to hunt down the brightest galaxies in the universe, and the closest and coldest stars in our local solar neighborhood. It happened to be that this satellite was also very good at detecting comets and asteroids, and so, after the original WISE mission concluded, the satellite was repurposed to look for asteroids and comets that could come close to Earth, and it was renamed to NEOWISE standing for Near Earth Object Wide Field Infrared Survey Explorer. NASA teams observed over 150,000 objects in the solar system, helping to expand our database of asteroids and comets, and also enhance our understanding of how often the Earth gets passed by asteroids and comets. And now, things are coming to an end. The spacecraft has no onboard propulsion, so it can't change its current orbit, and so it's gradually being dragged down by Earth's atmosphere, which means that it's getting more and more difficult to operate, and so scientists are preparing to put the spacecraft to sleep before it enters the atmosphere, whereupon it will poetically become a shooting star itself, just like the asteroids and comets that it's been monitoring. The hibernation command will be sent this week on the 8th of August, and re-entry is expected later this year or early 2025. The spacecraft's successor, the Near Earth Object Surveyor, is already under construction, so the open role left by NEOWISE will soon be filled again. Speaking of NASA missions, Juno recently completed its 61st flyby of Jupiter back in May this year. NASA recently shared this image, created by citizen scientist Gary Eason, using raw data from Juno's instruments, capturing this color-enhanced view of Jupiter's northern hemisphere, giving us a great view of the raging chaotic clouds and cyclonic storms. This area is known as a folded filamentary region, and in these regions, the zonal jets that create the usual familiar banded patterns in Jupiter's clouds break down, creating turbulent patterns and extremely variable cloud structures. But that's it for today's episode of Space This Week. I hope you enjoyed it, and if you did, make sure to leave a like down below. If you haven't seen my latest Kerbal Space Program video, then check that out as well. In it, I discovered the amazingness that is the free IVA mod, and I used it to explore the inside of a massive space station that I built largely from Natea's Stocker-like station parts mod. Of course, big thank you now to my Patreon and YouTube member supporters as well. Your support really does make all of this content possible, so thank you so much to everyone named on the left there. 